Yo, welcome to The World is My Burrito, aka Twimby, Mars Madness Edition, a podcast where I journey across the stars and scour the red planet to provide you with the best legends. Today we're covering the 2023 Kickstarter comic Vampire Hunter D Message from Mars, an American project based on an otherwise untranslated short story by the author of the Vampire Hunter series himself, Hideyuki Kikuchi. What's up, all you Martian Manhunters and centuries-old cougars? Welcome to the what I think is my first intentionally-themed series. As always, it's your cybernetic host of Podcast Past, from the future, Corey T, coming at you from Tampa, Florida, this lovely, what is it, March 17th, 2024. Uh, let's get right into things with Dish Duty. How's that sound? I've never really liked the term kitchen keeping, but it was the best I could come up with in the beginning, and I could never like trump that. Uh, I finally asked Zach for some ideas. Zach from the Neatcast, and this is one of them. Uh, what do you think? Dish duty? Uh, sound good? If not, feel free to express any and all negative opinions to him on Twitter. Um, if you like it, uh, I guess, let me know. It's probably okay to spoil the remainder of the Mars Madness plan, right? Uh, if only so you can hold me accountable for my promises, then judge me for my indiscretions. The other planned titles are Battle Angel Alita, Mars Chronicles, the manga, which I've already started on, Carol and Tuesday, the manga and anime, and finally, hopefully not regrettably, Terra for Mars, the manga and anime. See, they're all Mars-themed, and like... Three out of the four have Mars in the title. This is a pretty good theme. I, I think so. I'm welcome. There's no way these can all be completed before March is over, but I'm pretty determined to complete this theme just to get an idea of what it's like to have responsibilities. Uh, maybe next year I'll do one of those planned things. I don't know. I also still have a few smaller things to make, uh, namely a little video on Akira Toriyama because, hey, pour one out. You don't need to be a fan of Dragon Ball Z or any of his work, but where Akira helped open the eyes to the quality that anime can achieve, DBZ really kicked down the f door and got it in here. Uh, there's only a nine year difference from Akira's first airing to when DBZ re-aired and actually became successful. Enough about sad stuff. Let's do a hot take. Uh, this title's good. It's a great blend of American Japanese art and storytelling in a very relaxed way. Sometimes being in the middle of the road fits the content better, and this does just that. Uh, comics are known for being short format, so this marriage to an already short story is very complimentary. Now, for some personal history and why I chose this... Uh, I'm a big fan of Vampire Hunter D Bloodlust, the 2001 movie. It is one of the few anime where the dub is amazing, even though John DiMaggio voices like seven or more characters, uh, and maybe especially because of that fact. It's, it is just an all-time, like, number one movie for me. You know, it has remained in, like, I don't know, top three, top five, whatever, uh, some kind of dumb list, uh, but it's always there at the tops for me. The blend of science fiction and fantasy really helps leave a lot of mystery in this world. Uh, we, the observers, have no idea what it takes to kill something or accomplish any feat, but D, the protagonist, does because he's the pro. And it's always easy-ish for him, but may not always be the same. D and Left Hand, the sidekick, are resourceful. He's kind of like a Batman, honestly. Also, I love Yamano's art. Uh, like, how can you be alive and not love Yamano's art? In a very real way, that's what makes Vampire Hunter D. So when this Kickstarter released, the advertising art caught my eye. And, uh, you know, the biscuit needed the risk, which paid off in the end. As for a little extra on the historical end, I haven't actually read any of the D novels yet. I was trying to collect them one by one from used bookstores, which is a pain in the butt because a lot of these had never been re-released. Uh, but then they finally started releasing omnibuses in 2021. But now I have a podcast, so it's physically impossible to read a book without reviewing it, right? 
right? So this is one of those where I can't really give you the synopsis or many further details without spoiling everything. So this is your spoiler alert. Like beyond the part where a message comes from Mars and our hero goes to Mars, it's technically all spoiled. So if you don't want this Matt Damon of a burrito spoiled, put him back on Earth. Uh, and if you did so choose to hold off for a minute, honestly, just go watch the 2001 Vampire Hunter D Bloodlust movie. It is beautiful to look at and such a great, fantastical, tragic story. Uh, again, that English dub is great if you want to go that route. So don't feel like you have to watch subbed and then come back. Message from Mars is told from the point of view of Cecil, a girl who could see the future, one of the human colonists on Mars. D arrives to find a colony that is little more than a blood farm, with Left Hand, his talking Left Hand with various unspecified abilities, by his side, D sets out to cleanse Mars of the vampiric scourge. We see the ascension of nobility in the aftermath of a nuclear war on Earth, and a part of the beginning of D's journey as a vampire hunter. Now, for a little bit of the author... Uh, like in short story information. I'm going to keep it short, but important. Hideyuki Kikuchi is the creator of the Vampire Hunter D novels being in 1983 and still running to this day. It's a sci-fi fantasy series set in a dystopian future where magic, myth, old tech, and new tech all exist side by side. Uh, in just the Bloodlust film, there's a decrepit western town, spaceships, werewolves, vampires, and so much more as it relates to the aforementioned genres. As a quick aside, D is a Dampir, a half-human, half-vampire. The character is very thin, specifically to contrast all the swole heroes that were kind of gaining popularity in America. This also released in 1983, which is the same year as Fist of the North Star, which actually began the popularity of the swole protags in Japanese media. D's left hand is its own being named Left Hand. Uh, I don't know what his abilities are and honestly don't want to ruin it for myself, so I'm not really going to look anything up. He can suck things in and blow things out is about as simple as it gets. He speaks the most of the duo, so I guess you can add blowing hot air to that list of abilities. Anyway, Kikuchi has apparently been hosting these events in Shinjuku called Talk Live for a few years now. It sounds like a mini convention directed at the younger generation where attendees can interact with special guests from sci-fi and horror publishing, movies, and anime industries. The actual short story of today's topic could be won at said event. What a neat thing to win, right? Like an unpublished story by a famed author. Also, from what they say and what I can find, this truly is the first time it's been published in any way, bringing us to the comic history. Originally titled Message from Cecil, this introduced those winners to a fantastical vampire hunter universe in a five-issue comic series that was also collected into a very nice hardcover trade paperback, which I'm holding up right now for those who chose to watch YouTube. Um, I'm not really pushing YouTube. I'd really much rather you listen to the podcast. YouTube's just kind of there. This campaign began on June 30th, 2016, the start of Anime Expo, and was supposed to conclude on August 8th, 2016, the end of Gen Con. I did not realize it was this old until researching for this episode and don't actually know why they took a damn five-year break. I know there's something in there about switching from one artist to another, but that's it. Uh, if you go to the Kickstarter right now, the originally advertised tier rewards are not what I could pick from back in, I think it was like 2021 when I signed up for this or 2022. I don't know. One of those, uh, but it'd be cool if they did, because maybe back then I could have afforded the Left Hand Statue 2016. It's a little weird that this is kind of a big deal, but I cannot find anything stating how this project even happened. And that is just baffling. Um, or at least uh, on like the websites and stuff, like nobody is saying how this ever came into existence. I didn't actually look at YouTube this time, so 
I'm sorry if it's like totally readily available. My bad. Let's just kind of pretend that this is like a taquito. So I just wanted to do stuff real quick. Also, I wanted to do stuff real quick. I'm going to go with the uh, creative team who worked on this. Because, you know, there's only a couple, all things considered. On the production in the original story, Hideyuki Kikuchi. The character design, Yoshitaka Amano. Created by Kurt Rauer. Series translator, Kevin Lee. Uh, the writer, Brandon Easton. Artist, Ryan Benjamin. Inks by Richard Friend. The marketing and additional art provided by Christopher Shai. Art germ, Agnes Garbowska. Hong Taik Nam. Jay Lee. Jun Chung. Artist assistant is Kira Brown. Editor in Lettering and Design, Emily Pearson. Layout, Sean Clapham. Production company was Peacock Print Co. The people from Unified Pictures who helped bring this together were executive producers Kurt Rauer and Scott McLean. Uh, on the Digital Frontier end, character designer... On the Digital Frontier end, character designer Yoichi Mori. Creative executive, Mitsumoto Suzuki. Technical director, Keitaro Hamabe. So on to our topic at hand. The story begins with the beginning of Cecil's message framed by Dee's landing on Mars. From here on out, we phase back and forth between the past and the present like a mountain road. When she waxes poetic about her history with Future Sight and seeing Dee's arrival, the panels are focused on Dee maneuvering through what is basically a side-scroller of a world. When she talks about hard history... Like what she sees in her foresight, the introduction to Mars, romance, vampire evasion, that's all focused on her. But when I hear for her, we're here for Mars. The nuclear war on Earth somehow leads to vampires leaving their mark on the Earth, so much so that they can comfortably head to Mars. Galtus, the noble of this vampiric group, and his gang somehow learn about the base and galactic drive and decide this is the best way to take over the remainder of the universe. For some reason, vampires can just exist in space, or at least on Mars, without any protection. There's no explanation for this, but they can, so clearly they are the ultimate species in the universe. For some reason, they need the galactic drive to go places. Uh, do you want to know what the galactic drive does, or is? So do I. It's never really explained. Moving on. One of the best visual representations in this is the stark difference between the vampires who arrive on Mars, all of which appear very normal and human to the point Cecil didn't notice a difference, and the vampires D defeats in the future, many of which have become biologically or artificially twisted or seemingly reverted back to a more primal stage. Somehow, both Franz and Cecil are of noble blood, which gives them additional powers, but don't worry about that either. Uh, the transference functions and benefits of noble blood aren't explained. Compare this with the humans, all of which were healthy in the beginning, but many of which look kind of like Gollum by Dee's arrival. Uh, the most human of them are either blood banks or servants directly to the throne. The remaining humankind have their own classes like laborers, subjects to scientific testing or whatever creepy vampiric needs they have. One page explains how the vampires were trying to alter human DNA and physiology to better suit them to space travel, but it didn't work. So Galtus instead threw people into a pit of all manner of viral bacterial infections in hopes of creating a more resilient line of human. Now this pit, uh, for those of you who won't get the chance to read this, is it looks like a vat of like meat and blood that they're just chucking people into. Uh, Mars is just yes. a hole. They did turn a nerdy science outfit into a dope castle, but it's a Son. hole nonetheless. The writing in this is great. The sheer disrespect of the human race is wonderfully written. Galtus has a great introductory line calling us unsuitable for interstellar colonization, incapable of operating the galactic drive. Uh, Franz saying the quiet thing out loud when talking about the stages turned vampires go through concerning human treatment. There are plenty of great witticisms from Left Hand and Cecil, as well as plenty of powerful statements throughout. 
In the same written vein, Cecil's precognition of death makes the vampiric angle more fun because it kind of throws a wrench in her previous understanding of how death works. Sometimes you can come back from the dead. She saw Franz die and was surprised by his return two years later, but also I guess she can see the second death. Um, Once again, it's not entirely explained. Uh, Maybe knowing that she is inevitably going to die, like maybe she can't see Franz's second death, but like that's the only way for her to die is for him to die. So it's like a logic thing. I don't know. Uh, she frequently talks about foresight as a prison uh, and the torture it causes. Nothing can ever be changed and nobody will ever understand that, creating enemies for Cecil. Knowing physical pain will come does not stop it from happening and does not stop like the actual pain itself from feeling any better. So she has to sit and wait as a vampire for a thousand years before seeing her final relief. And uh, another kind of point worth mentioning is like the the mental aspect of it all, um, which I guess I kind of mentioned that it is a torture of its own kind. So yeah, she's kind of stuck living for a thousand years waiting for D to come uh, and kill her because he is a vampire hunter. That's That's got to be a lot on your mind constantly. And before leaving the writing bit, they, the two journals are fun. So it's called Message from Cecil. The dominant narrator in this whole thing is Cecil's message to D. But there is a bit with Franz uh, where he talks about what it's been like living with her for you know the past 300, 600 years. Um, Franz does truly seem to have a thing for Cecil, which is why he not only tries to preserve her life, but so readily dies for her when the inevitability arises. Uh, this this is a lot of fun. Like It kind of seems like he is heartless or doing something for dumb reasons, but then as you go through more of it, yeah, he truly does love her. If you're that listener who is wholly unfamiliar with the vampire hunter world, Things just have powers, and there's never an explanation. Do you notice a theme here? Some vampires can phase through things. Some are made out of lightning. Some seem to be built into mech suits, but all are weak to wooden stakes, garlic bombs, Dee's trusty longsword, and having every atom of their body eradicated. Oh, and yeah, I guess they can just live in space uh, on the side of strengths. So that does kind of continue pursuing the magic that I I found in, you know, Bloodlust and even the original movie of, you know, nothing's explained and it is just so fun. I will probably always talk smack about Twilight because those rules just seem kind of dumb. And then you have this world where everything's made up and the points don't matter. It goes so far out into left field. You're like, yeah, I'm sure a vampire could turn into pure energy yet still be cut by a sword. That checks out. Just in the Bloodlust movie alone, there's a human who can create an ethereal duplicate and shoot lasers, a plant girl who can move freely through plants like water, and a werewolf, but his chest is the mouth. Uh, Are you confused? Embrace it. Again, combining so many aspects of fantasy, sci-fi, myths, you name it, it becomes much more freeing to me. It's like all of the the possibilities truly are endless. You can just do whatever. Uh, and it checks out because they don't really seem to break those rules. D must always win, and how he does it, probably going to be by using his long sword. How are the enemies going to fight him? Nobody knows. It's like a JoJo's level thing right there. You never know what the stand abilities are. Speaking of things that aren't explained, let's talk about how Galtus goes into hibernation looking like a stream bean, then comes out looking like Count von Schwarzenegger. Once again, no explanation, but I am here for it. Maybe we won't like nobles when they're mad, but his seething rage is very entertaining. Dude busts through the ceiling, butt naked, shoves D onto an exposed beam for safekeeping, walks up to Franz and rips him in half, then goes to torturing Cecil. This is where the weird fun of Japanese storytelling shines. It's not one-liners, it's the actions. The threat is very real, but there's still like so much humor in these moments. And at the same time, you're not exactly laughing. You're just like enthralled by what's going on. 
I think maybe the final point uh, worth mentioning, at least for me, is how this is just a side scroller. D arrives, offs a dude with no effort, enters a room with creatures, offs them with barely more effort, and just kind of keeps entering more rooms with more complex enemies. The first dude returns as a mid boss. The final boss literally takes him down to the base level for a showdown. So it is a fun kind of way to wrap all this up. He starts on the ground, he ends on the ground. One of the other things that's worth mentioning truly is the art. Like, you know, when this the title like this comes out, it's like, well, how are you going to do this without, you know, how are you going to do this without like a Japanese team? Um, is certainly a, a question that always comes to my mind because there's definitely, you know, not knocking American artists doing things for like Japanese works. There's tons of like IDW stuff for Godzilla that's absolutely phenomenal. The storytelling, still amazing. You know, plenty of it still feels very Japanese. But then there are so many other comics where, you know, they they have the kind of Japanese aesthetic and you can tell what they're going for. But it's definitely not fully there. Um, so the the art in this was obviously like extremely important to to nail down. I love how if anything's glowing, it's like hazy. So you'll have all these like crisp edges, but you know, whether it be a glowing pendant or maybe the glow of the sunlight or the glow of a reflection off something, um, it's just, you know, beautifully done. Like you, you feel it is a cartoon, but you feel like you're looking into a little bit more of reality. Yeah, that, that was important. Uh, the art is great. The, transference of action or series of actions from panel to panel uh, is always like pretty easy to follow. It seemed, I don't know what it was about it, but it seemed easier to follow physically reading the book than looking at the digital copy that I got. No, I think that's kind of it for like the main topic and likes. Uh, I realized like I probably should show a little bit more of what I got. Like this is the hardcover. Actually, I need to go over. There we go. So yeah, the hardcover, uh, there's no page numbers. I don't know how many it is. Uh, they they throw in their own art. Let's see, I'm going to take the dust jacket off. Um, even with the dust jacket off, like it only honestly kind of makes it even cooler. Like I love this cover. Uh, again, I'm not pushing YouTube, but you know, right now it sucks to be a listener. Um, but they have plenty of the like marketing art, the hype art from all the artists kind of throughout the book usually separating chapters. Um, so actually, I, I kind of have a chapter account digitally, but yeah, I'm not looking at that. Um, it's it's a good read. It's five solid issues of comics. Uh, and then one of the best things, I, I'm always a huge fan of how things are made. So they have some of these pages where they will go from the paneling of like, here are the pencils, and then here's the inks, uh, or I guess like the the storyboarding, so the super basic storyboarding, and then the more detailed pencils, and then the inks, and then the colors and text and stuff added after the fact. Um, that's, to me, a real fun thing to get in this. It's just included in the book. It's not an extra thing. Um, they have a ton of pages of uh, like those breakdowns. And then, you know, the back is essentially every piece of marketing art that they used for this. Um the because they didn't have any super cool kits, I only got the hardback edition of it. Um, the only other thing that I ordered with it as like an add on was some of the actual art. Um, a couple of like uh, I think it was like eight and a half by 11s or something and five by sevens. So it was a lot of fun. It was nicely packaged. Um, and it, it is a very high quality printed book, I would say. And now we're going to get into dislikes. This is going to be a little bit of a surprisingly long section, but not for the traditional reasons. Um, I have only one truly teeny tiny dislike about our topic, and it's just the digital version. There are no chapter markers. And it ain't much, but there is some benefit to having a visual marker separating parts of the story. Uh, on first read, I became confused at some of the letter, the message, because we reached bits of narrative from Franz's perspective. So 
it seemed like some bits were Cecil and some Franz, uh, like when reading through this chapter, but then I realized it's it's all actually just Franz. Had there been a chapter break, uh, this change would have been far more obvious. So like I read this twice. Um, the first time it was digitally because I was out of town. And then the second time I cracked open the physical copy and was like instantly able to recognize the change in author. Uh, and so one of the things that you'll notice I am missing on this episode, particularly about the book history, is um, a, a, a whole lot about production. I mean, again, there's not a whole lot of off options. Again, there's not a whole lot of information. Uh, so when you look at the Kickstarter page, it really does look like this went dead for a while with like no responses from the creators. Um, like when you go to the comment section, I think some of the most recent comments were like two years ago. It's pretty quick to find some from like three and I think four years ago and there's zero response. And that's a bummer. Uh, I, I don't know what was going on here. Um, I don't know if there's any type of a history out there behind this. I don't feel like anyone would air their dirty laundry, but it, yeah, that just seems like a bit of a disservice. Again, I just lucked out that I just happened to see this in like 2021, 2022 um, and it's like, cool, I'll hop on. And it was delivered like a year and a half later, which, or maybe a little more than a year and a half, but either way, kind of a perfectly expected timeline because it wasn't yet closed. Uh, it's a bummer. Um, you know, I don't know how many people hopped off of this or even could hop off of this who ordered this back in 2016. I don't know if they ever got any of the cool shit. Cause again, I only just learned that they had like the pendant. They had all of these other like tchotchkes that you could get that were not part of what I saw when I was looking at, you know, getting a tier. Um, yeah, I don't know about that. It's kind of a bummer. Actually, that'd be worth posting about online. Anyways, uh, one of the other kind of huge things, um, it's a little annoying that I can't tell you, hey, go buy this. This is not readily available in any way. It seems like only two issues are available for the physical comic, and good luck finding one at a reasonable price. Um, I saw one of these sets, so it was the... Um, it looked like it was just my hardback version, but it said oversized, as well as um, like the six individual issues, then a couple of other things like pieces of art on eBay for $5,700. Um, I, I it had like a signed, there was like a name signed into it. I don't think it was Hideyuki. Um, so that, I don't know. That just seems absurd to me for that kind of a price. Uh, Stranger Comics themselves don't even offer a digital version on their website. I get not making everything involved in the Kickstarter readily available to the masses and maybe never producing more physical copies, but not even digital, like Stranger Comics indeed. Maybe there was some kind of agreement with Kikuchi or it's a time thing. Uh, as of this year, like I think January or February, I got the email that all global productions have been delivered. So maybe something will change in the future. Uh, you know, otherwise, don your eye patch and peg leg or just learn how to use email. I'm going to go out on a limb and assume that nobody listening to this episode has read this. Uh, at least nobody within the first 20 to 40 streams. Maybe after that, I'll get some of the people who actually back to this. So instead of asking your thoughts, uh, I'll once again recommend you go check out Bloodlust. If you're feeling super spunky, go check out the original movie. Um, there was an era where it was like a point of pride to have, you know, an underground VHS copy of the original Vampire Hunter D. I just remember that being a goofy as shit movie. Um, both should be far more available and affordable now than they were when I was young. Yeah, it sucked having to buy Bloodlust ages ago. Like I lucked out during a window when it was available and then it was like two weeks later the Blu-ray was going for like hundreds of dollars. Um, I think now you can just buy the 4K. Oh, and yeah, while we're still here, this is one of those movies that will only look better as like scanning improves and like TV quality improves. Um, it 
it, it just looks so great. Like I've loved seeing this on like VHS, on DVD, on Blu-ray every single time. It just looks absolutely immaculate. So enough juicing over that. Uh, references. The only real references in this episode were the Vampire Hunter D fandom page and then the Kickstarter campaign page. Um, hey, that's it for today. I'm avoiding Nacho Business because the next episode is currently in the works. I'll do some other videos or something for side content. As I mentioned, like Akira Toriyama, I think I might want to cover Collective Con because that was a lot of fun. Anyways, if you want to chat me up, uh, you can follow me on social media at Twin Bee Podcast. That's Twitter, Blue Sky, Instagram, uh, Facebook. Um, I don't know, anywhere, name a place. Uh, email twinbeepodcast at gmail.com. You can go to the website, twinbeepodcast.com. That is just the Buzzsprout page, but either way, you know, you can do it. Uh, yeah, honestly, that's it. Deuces. <laughs>